I'm Corey Patterson. I'm Dave and Linda's daughter. Um, I live about two hours north of here with my husband and my children, which one is gone, one is here. Anyway, um, it's an honor to be here. When my dad first asked me to, to come down and, and speak, um, you know, you always think to yourself, like, I don't know, how's it going to go? They don't know me. I don't know them, you know. Um, but it's an honor, and I felt like God told me to say yes, and then I felt like God gave me something specific to share with you, so I'm really excited about that. But I'm going to pray first because I'm nervous. Heavenly Father, I thank you for this privilege, this honor, this just the delight of getting to be with your, your body, your, this family, get to be joined in with them and worship with them, and thank you for the powerful worship, and just thank you for every person that's here today, every heart that's <coughs> here facing you. And Lord, I just ask of you what I always ask of you, that you would get me out of your way, that you would speak. It would be your words, not mine that it would be your heart and not mine. Um, and I, again, Father, just commit this time to you, ask for you to fill it and to be working through it. And I ask for you to locate each person here, that something would stir in their hearts, that no one would leave untouched this morning. And, um, and I just say, Father, that if anything goes well this morning, that it would be to your glory. And if all of it fails, Father, that would be for your glory too. So we love you and uh, just commit this time to you. Amen. Okay, so I want to talk to you this little morning a little bit about finding your purpose. I could talk about anything for hours. So feel free to start throwing things at me when I've reached like the time when you've got to go home and get your roast out of the oven or whatever it is. Um, I want to talk about finding your purpose. Um, and if I were you and I were sitting where you're sitting this morning and, I, and I, someone were saying to me, I want to talk about finding your purpose, I would immediately tune out. I would immediately tune out to that topic because I would first of all think, okay, listen, if you have more, if there's more for me to have to accomplish in life than what I'm already doing, I don't have time for it. <laughs> so if you want to tell me that God has more for me to be doing on this earth, I'm going to play Candy Crush on my phone for the next 45 minutes because I can't keep up with what's already on my plate. Okay? I have a husband and I have children and they're like the most wonderful things ever, but still they're work. And I've got a job. I have three of them. And that's work. And I try to keep my house somewhat tidy. Don't come over right now because... I would be lying to say that it was somewhat tidy. And, and that's work. And there's just life is hard. So, you know, I'm sorry. And if it's life, sometimes it's work. Yes. Right? So if I, if I were in your seat and someone were saying to me, I'm going to talk to you about finding your purpose, I would be like, okay, so let's just text each other for the next 45 minutes until she's done. So I, my, my first thought is like, so what's the big, I'm going to skip that slide altogether. So what's the big deal? What's the big deal? Finding your purpose. What's the big, big deal? I feel like I'm doing one of those TED Talks. Have any of you seen any of those TED Talks? Because I got like technology in the background and this thing. I'm not sure if I'm supposed to do like a Britney Spears song. Okay. So what's the big deal? It's like I actually think that sometimes like isn't it enough? Like isn't it enough what I already have my hands to? I mean some of you have jobs that are very purposeful. Like maybe you're an educator and you go to school every day and you change lives. Or maybe you're a doctor and you go to work every day and you save lives. Or I don't know, maybe you build you know, homes for the needy, whatever. Some of your lives are so full of purpose, you're like, I got this covered. I don't need to hear about purpose. But I don't know, have you ever like woken up and thought, there's gotta be more. There's gotta be more than just getting up every day and going to work and paying my bills and hoping I can pay my bills. And there's just gotta be more. There's gotta be something more. There's gotta be some deeper meaning. There's gotta be some deeper purpose. Does any of you ever relate to that? And the funny thing is, is when I first started putting this together, I actually asked, I actually, I asked young people specifically. So I don't know, who's like, the, who's like the oldest young person? Is my daughter the oldest young person in the room this morning? My mom is the oldest young person in the room this morning, that's right. So I specifically asked young people, I said, if I were to ask you what your purpose was, or no, don't even tell me your purpose, tell me what, what words come into your head when you think of purpose. Some of them say things like adventure and exciting, and some of them think things like terrified. You know, because even just thinking, like, do I have a greater purpose? Does this day have a greater purpose? That can be scary. I don't know. Sometimes it's like you just put your, like, you just put your nose to the grindstone, right? And you just get through. Just get through. I don't even want to think about what's up out there. But then sometimes you lay your head on your pillow and you're like, there's got to be more. So to me, I'm going to quote Mark Twain here. He's not necessarily a Christian, but I think this is one of my dad's favorite authors, right? Mark Twain said, the two most important days in your life are the day you are born and the day you find out why. You know what I thought of when I read this was Kay Warren. So some of you may have heard of Rick Warren. He's a very huge pastor of the Saddleback Church, and there's a gazillion people that go there. And his wife, Kay Warren, and they had been, they founded this church like 25 years ago, and they had been this huge, massive church, gazillion people. That feels like that should have a lot of purpose, 
right? If you're Kay Warren and you're leading a church of like 20,000 people, that would feel like your life has a lot of purpose, right? But about seven years ago, she was reading an article on AIDS and the AIDS epidemic in Africa and how many thousands of children are orphaned every day. And she said her heart just broke open and she started to cry. She was 55 years old. And she said, God, I have to do something. So then she went to Africa, she came back, and now her church has an annual AIDS convention every year where they start to educate people in this country about what we can do about the problem in that country. And she says that when she looks at her life, it's broken right down the middle by that day, the 55 years before AIDS and every day after. And it's like something hit her, some kind of purpose gripped her life. She was 55 years old. She'd been living a completely purpose-filled life. Matter of fact, that's her husband's book, The Purpose-Filled Life. She had been living a purpose-filled life up to that moment. But she was 55 years old and something gripped her. And it was like everything in her life had come to that moment. And that was one of the most important days of her life. And she was 55 years old. And when I was thinking about that story, it hit me. like a, It gripped my heart like a vice. And I heard God say to me, make sure they know that it's not too late for them to find their purpose. Yes. So that is the first thing that God wants to say to you this morning is, no matter what has happened in your life up until this moment, it is not too late for you to find your purpose. Whether you're five or 55 or 85, it is not too late. And it doesn't matter what's happened up till now, it doesn't matter your circumstances, it doesn't matter how fruitful and purposeful your life has been till this moment, it is not too late for God to give you your purpose today. Okay, that's important. If nothing else, you remember, God has a purpose for you. Okay, so the purpose, it's a big deal. God's ultimate purpose for your life, all of you can fit into this category. His ultimate purpose for you is that you would know him and make him known. That's it. That's just that simple, that you would know God and you would make him known. And the beauty of that is that the more you know God, the more you love him. You know that song? It's old, right? To know, know, know him is to love, love, love him, and I do. It's like a 50s boob out song, right? It was actually talking about a guy, but we're going to apply it to God. The more you know him, the more you love him, and then the more you love him, the more you can't stop talking about him, and you can't stop telling other people about him. You know, like the hopes is that you would be that really gushy guy or girl in a relationship that you're like, I love you, I love you too, I love you. You're kind of hoping that you're like that about God. Because the more you know him, the more you love him, and then you can't stop talking about him, and it becomes just kind of your whole existence is to be in love with God. So that's kind of your ultimate purpose, to know him and to make him known. But that's not your whole purpose. You have, like, specific purpose. And if you've been in this church for any length of time or walked past the sign on the way in, there's a verse that we like to quote a lot when it talks about your future or your purpose in God, right? I mean, it's right on the sign when you walk in. Does anybody know what it is? I have prizes. Who said it? Patty, you want a prize? Patty said it first. I have prizes for you. Okay, so the, the verse that we talk about when we talk about purpose or your future or plans of God, we always say that I know the plans I have for you, said the Lord, plans to prosper you, not to harm you, plans to give you hope, which is the verse that this whole church is based on, and a future. That's a great verse, right? Don't we love that verse? God has plans for your life. Some of you are like, oh, I'm not sure about that. But God has plans for your life, and they're to give you a hope and a purpose, and it's awesome, and it's huge, and it's so big. I mean, it's like, it's like the concept of his purposes. He's like an infinite God, right? I mean, there, is, there it is, right? There's the universe. He's an infinite God. He has a purpose for you, and yet he's the creator of the whole universe. So, I mean, when you think about your purpose in God, it could be anything. It can be huge. It could be like curing cancer being the king of some country, being the next Billy Graham. I mean, there's a gazillion purposes possible for you. But that's an uncomfortable topic. So what we try to do is we try to, like, shrink it down into something manageable. Like, like well, um, I don't really know what God's plans are for you specifically, and it's an infant topic. So I'm just going to say, like, God has his plan, your plan in God is to, I don't know, just love him. That's God's plan for you. But what we tend to do, and this mainly makes me laugh, Tell me if you can re relate to this at all. We tend to break God's purposes for you down into two main categories. Okay, this one's my favorite. We, this, I call this the happy family's purpose. Okay, we talk about your future in God, and we say God's plan is for you to have a nice family. Okay, you get married. And, and nowadays, when you hear this talk, 
they'll always say, they'll always make sure that they mention that your husband or wife's going to be hot. I don't know why they do that. You're going to have a nice, attractive husband or wife, right, and happy children, okay? You're going to have a beautiful white picket fence in your home because God wants you to be happy, right? So he's going to give you this beautiful thing. You're probably going to have loads of money, and you're going to have the American dream. And we say, follow God, because if you do things God's way, you're going to have a happy family with happy children and a happy house with lots of money because God wants to prosper you, and this is going to be your life, and that's God's purpose for you. Have you ever heard anybody preach a sermon that sounds a little bit like that? Yes. Okay. But then you have the other extreme. No, 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 no. When we talk about God's plans for your life, we are actually going to be a missionary in Africa. <laughs> You're probably going to have to eat a lot of strange food, maybe even like a grasshopper. And you probably will have a family that looks more like this, right? <laughs> like 18 children, you know, where they all wear ties to church every Sunday. And no matter which path you go, you're not going to have any money because that's the way. <laughs> and those are like the two purposes that we, we okay, here's God's plan for your life. You're either, you're either going to hear this God's purposes for you or that you're going to be happy and you're going to have a nice family, you're going to have nice children and you're going to have white picket fence or no, God wants you to give up all of that and live in a third world nation and eat cockroaches. <laughs> those are the messages that I heard when I was younger, when, God would, when people would talk about God's purposes for your life. And generally speaking, when you, when you hear those messages, you have a kind of one of three reactions. Part of you is like, yes, that's what I want. I want a happy house. I want the happy families. Or some of you were like, yes, all I ever wanted to do in the whole world was go love on the children in Africa. So either way, you're like, yes, that sounds good. God has purposes for me. Some of you were like, um, no, I'm not really interested in that. Neither of those two things sound like what I want out of life. And actually, when I think about what God wants for my life, I'm like, I'm not interested in what God wants for life. I'm only, I'm only interested in what I want out of my life. So I'm just going to kind of give this whole thing a, a pass. And then some of you are like me. I was raised in church, so I didn't feel like I could honestly say yes. I also didn't feel like I was allowed to say no. So I'm like, um. Matter of fact, if you were, in, um, if you were like one of the kids in the school that, um, that I sometimes uh, teach at and, and that I work at, um, you ask the question, like, how do you feel about God's purposes for your life? And they'll look up at you and go, Wait, what? That's the typical reaction, right? And that could be it. You're thinking about God's purposes for your life, and you're like, I just, I just don't know. And the truth is that scenario number one, happy families, might be your scenario. And scenario number two, starving missionary, might be your scenario. But God's purposes are infinite. They're infinite. They're so much bigger than we can conceive of. We don't have to put God down into a little bitty box. Why would we want a God that could fit in a box? Right? We serve an infinite God. So he has infinite purposes for you. And I can guarantee you that his purposes for your life are greater and more awesome and more terrifying and more wonderful and more risky and more adventurous and more fantastic and more terrible than anything you could think. They're just amazing. When you actually just throw yourself all in, all chips in, I am all into God's purposes for my life. It's just, it's just the best thing ever. But I can't tell you what your purpose is. So I'm really sorry if you thought I could. Please forgive me. But I can tell you this. That God's purposes for your life are going to have six characteristics. I made it into a nice easy word so you'd remember it. Does anybody want to try to pronounce that? I have a prize for you, if you do. For what? Yeah. I figured that that was maybe not as easy to remember as I wanted it to be. So instead, I turned it into, what's it called, honey? You're the English teacher. An, ac an acronym. An acronym. I kept calling it an anacronym. I don't know why I did that. An acronym. I turned it into an acronym that you will absolutely not forget. OK, you ready for it? Furry warts grow under her feet. You can turn it to his. It can be gender neutral. Furry warts grow under his feet. Okay, I can take off my socks right now and show you that I don't actually have any. I'm not actually talking about myself. But let's remember, furry warts grow under her feet. Can you all say that for me? Okay, so when the next time when someone's like, hey, did you ever hear that girl, Corey Patterson? You can say, was that the girl with furry warts growing under her feet? You can do that. I'm okay with that. Okay, say it again for me. Furry warts grow under her feet. That's pretty good. I'll take it. Okay, so I'm going to break this down for you and say that God's purposes for your life are going to have six characteristics, okay? And you're going to remember them because I turned it into furry warts grow under your feet. Okay, so the first one, the F, <laughs> stands for four. <clears throat> the F stands for four because the most important thing that you need to know about God's purpose for your life is that God is for you, not against you. 
This is crucial. This is like Christianity. Like after you understand salvation and the work of the cross, the next thing that you need to know about God is that he is for you, not against you. And we know how God is talked about, right? We know how he's talked about in the radio. We know he's talked about in the magazines. And every message that we get about God is that he hates things. Right? That he's against certain people or he's against certain religions or he's against certain political groups or he's against certain ways of living. That's what we hear about God. And it's absolutely critical that you know that his purpose is for you. The Bible actually talks about how his spirit hovers over the earth looking for people he can bless. Is that what we hear about God? That's just not the message that we get about God. And it's important that we know that. God is for you, not against you. And that's so crucial because when we know that about God, we actually want to spend time with him. When we think about God as the God that's like, you better get your act straight or I'm not talking to you. When we think about the God that's like, you can't come to me because you sinned yesterday, or in my case, five minutes ago. (laughs) When we think about God that way, we don't even want to be with him. I'm going to pick on my husband for this story because, you know, He's here, and he said he was going to love me forever, so he has to stay with me. (laughs) Several years ago, I had gotten this bonus from my job, and I really wanted to get my husband something special. He's not the kind of person that spends money on himself ever. So I thought, I want to get him something really, really special. So I went out and secretly got him an iPad. But I was a little worried because my husband really loves to play games. I mean, like, really loves to play games. And I could just kind of see that it was probable that if I got him an iPad, he would download a bunch of games on his iPad and I might never see him again. I could like envision that he would be playing games on it all the time, every day, and there would go our marriage. But I still really wanted to bless him and I still knew he would really love it. And so I, you know how you can get it engraved? Like if you order the product, you can get it engraved. I actually have engraved and you can look at it and we might even have it with him today. I actually have engraved on the back, this will never love you as much as I love you. That's what it says on the back of my husband's iPad. So I was a little worried about it. So anyway, he gets his iPad. He's super excited. He first thing he does is download 85 games. And for like a month, he, he played it a lot. Like a lot. Like I'm like thinking, huh, it's been about 30 days and we haven't done anything in 30 days because he plays games every time he can. And I was just about to like say something. Like, okay, the thrill should have worn off and you should be paying attention to me now. And... He actually stopped and he said, I was praying this morning and I was actually like kind of telling God how sorry I was that I haven't spent any time with him in a month because I'm playing games. And I felt really guilty about it. And so I said to God, please forgive me for all this time I've spent playing games this month. And God said back to him, Wayne, when you know that I'm the God that created you to play games, you'll want to spend time with me. And it just like floored him. See, my husband comes alive when he's playing games. There's this like mischievous Irish twinkle in his eye. (laughs) And he just becomes this person. And he does this in his classroom. He's a teacher and his students love him because he turns every lesson into a game. I mean, they can't wait to come into, you can hear them in the classroom, in the hallway, talking about Mr. Patterson's game and how they, they store up homework points so they can go further in the game that he created about conquering the world for global studies. And he just comes alive. And not only does he come alive, but he reflects a part of the heart of God that's in Wayne. Because that's part of the heart of God. We like to talk about God, and we don't talk about him as a game player, but you know what? He created fun. And so when my husband is playing games, he's reflecting a part of the heart of God that I desperately need to see because I'm not as fun as he is. I need that in my life. He was supposed to want to play games. But we don't think that way about God. We think like, when if I'm doing something I really love to do, it's probably distracting me from God and I should probably repent and then go do something very serious and holy so I can be godly today. God is for you. Well, I knew this was going to happen. Is it even on me still? God is for you. There, I said it. Not against you. He wants you to delight yourself in him. Coming into God's purposes will make you come alive. It's not going to squash you down. And I just remember being a teenager, even in my 20s, thinking, once I've had my fun, I'll come to God. 
because when I finally sign all into God's purposes, things are going to get boring. <laughs> I'm not going to get to do what I love because especially, especially like 20 years ago when I was, when I was sitting through kind of churches in the, in the 80s and, and maybe it was 30 years ago, I'm a little older than I think I am, a lot of times the messages were like, you know, women should be quiet not say anything and be really demure and I was like well, I should run from the church screaming because there's no place for me there and yet somewhere in my 20s God hit me I was I was right I was running around a track up up where I live um, and I had come I live up in the Adirondacks and we used to go up to the Adirondacks for camp and it was like my favorite time of the year and so I just fell in love with this place you know when you go somewhere on vacation it's like your favorite place on earth we used to go up to the Adirondacks for vacation so it was my favorite place on the earth and I was running around this track in the Adirondacks looking at these mountains that as a child I loved and playing on the field that as a child I had loved and I was singing this old song from is it delirious the happy song I could sing an ending songs of how you say it. right it's delirious right and the chorus is um, uh, something, 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 and then it says, for now I know that God is for me, not against me. And I was running and singing that, and I looked up at these mountains, and it hit me that God was for me. Like, I don't have to spend the rest of my life trying to earn it or be good enough for it or conform myself to this weird pattern that I think is what a Christian's supposed to be. I can be who God made me to be, and he was going to be for me, not against me. And wouldn't it be great if we treated each other as if we believed that? Like that God is for you, not against you. And so as your sister in Christ, I'm going to be for you, not against you. I'm not going to make my whole life purpose about changing you. I'm going to leave that to God. Instead, I'm just going to be God's love for you. Okay, God is for you, not against you. Okay, furry warts grow under her feet. Say that for me. Her furry warts grow under her feet. Okay, you're right. I got, I got like a third of you with me still. <laughs> Okay, God is for you, not against me, not against you. Psalm 34, 8 says, Taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the one who takes refuge in him. Psalm 118, 6, where this verse is from, says, The Lord is for me. I will not be afraid. Okay. When we allow ourselves to fall into God's purposes, when we understand that God is for us, not against us, we will find that becoming a Christian and serving God doesn't mean destroying who we are. It means revealing who we are. The closer we get to God, the more we see who we were really made to be. And we come alive. And it's a beautiful thing. Okay, W. For furry warts. The W stands for want. Everything you want in life is found in him and in his purpose. So if you were to take a minute and stop and say, what do I want my life to look like? What do, what do I want my purpose in God to be? What would you envision? If you even dream, some of you don't even dream because you think life has kicked me down so many times I don't even bother to dream anymore. But if you were to stop and dream, what do you want your life to look like? What would you envision for yourself? Anybody? Anybody want to? What? Happiness. Happiness. That's good. That's excellent. You actually, you're actually so far ahead now, you skipped on to the second part of this. <laughs> Circumstantially, you get extra prizes. I can't reach you without hitting someone else, but I have a prize for you up here. I would hit Mark right in the head if I tried to throw something at you right now. If circumstantially, what does your life look like? What do you want from your future? What do you, what do you see? A car? A nice car? Do anybody have a nice car in their head? Come on, be real. Be legit. Retirement. Retirement. Good. Right? <laughs> Rest. I hear you, Patty. Money? Absolutely. Go for it, Darlene. How about like a good marriage? Obedient children? In my happy future, my kids obey me. I don't know about your kids, but my kids obey in my happy future. Um, travel, vacation, right? How about um, a boat? Yes. Good health. Okay, those are good things. Nothing we listed was bad. Everything we just said were good. Those were good things. And everything that we want in life, they're good, right? We want. We, none of us are like we don't want to like blow up a building or you know, burn something, right? So we want good things, right? We want good things for our lives. Why? Okay, now you can go ahead and give your answer. Why do we want good things for our lives? Because we want to be happy, right? We want to be happy. We figure if we can get these circumstances the way we want them, we'll be happy. Actually, when I broke it down, I feel like there's three things. If, no matter what I looked at, it came down to three things. Either I wanted to be happy or I wanted to be loved 
because that's pretty legit. We want a good relationship because we just want to be loved, right? And we just want to know we're loved. We want love. And then the third piece is that we want to feel safe. We want to feel secure. Sometimes we want money not just because we think it'll make us happy, but because we think then we'll be safe. Then we'll feel security. Especially if you've come or grown up in an unsafe home, that need to be safe, it's, it's, it's really legit. So pretty much every circumstance that we try to orchestrate in our life is either to make us happy, make us loved, or make us safe. Keep us at, at safe. And the beautiful thing about God is those are the first three things that he addresses when he says, if you have my spirit in you, you will have peace. love, joy, and peace. You will be happy, you will be loved, and you will be safe in your heart. We know this because Galatians 5, to 23 says, for the fruit of the spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control. It's the only scripture in the Bible I've memorized, pretty much, except for the one that says Jesus wept. It's the only scripture I've memorized because my husband turned it into a song that's kind of goofy. It goes like this. I'm going to say, of course I'm going to sing it. You didn't think I was going to sing it for you? I'm totally going to sing it for you. It goes like this. It goes like this. It's like kind of like jazzy. Tommy, can you keep like a cool jazz beat for me? You did really good today on the drums, by the way. Isn't Tommy a great drummer? So good. Okay. It goes, like this. It goes Galatians 5, 22 to 23. Galatians 5, 22 to 23. And it goes like this. For the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace. Okay. But then you got to get all jazzy on me. You gotta get like that blues voice, you know, like really, gotta go, gotta go, gotta go, gotta go. Patience, kindness, goodness, like that. <laughs> Faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. Galatians 5, 22 to 23. Galatians 5, 22. Okay, one more time with me, ready? For the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace. Patience, kindness, goodness. Very good. Faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. That's good! Everything you think you want, everything you think you want is actually found in him, in the spirit. Every goal you have for your future, the thing you really want, whether you want money, retirement, vacation, boat, happy marriage, obedient children, all of the things you want are because what you really want is love, joy, and peace. And those things are only found in him. And when we run after the circumstances that we think will bring us those things, all we ever get is emptiness. You only have to look at like a handful of celebrities to know that the circumstances are not what matters. Everything you want is found in him. Okay, that's the W, furry warts. The last four go really quick. Furry warts grow. G, gifts. Gifts. His purposes will use the gifts and talents he's given you. Okay, he's given you all gifts. He's given you all things that you can use that equip you to serve him. You have a natural aptitude for something, and God wants to use it. I love the story in the Bible where Jesus finds the fishermen, right? He goes up to these guys that are fishing and he says, hey, have you caught fish all night? And they say no. And then he says, throw your nets over to the other side. And then they catch like a gazillion fish, which is ridiculous. And then they look at him and say, right, Jay, you're a fisher. That's crazy to think about. I know it was God. <laughs> But from a fisher's perspective, it's crazy. I've been doing this all night. I'm going to throw my net on the other side, and I'm going to get fish. Yeah, and God, you will. But at any rate, then they all look at him like, well, who are you that you can make me catch all these fish? And then he says, come and follow me. And he says, and I will make you bankers and accountants. <laughs> he doesn't say that. He says to these guys that are fishers by trade, he says, come and follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. Now, we have this friend. His name is Jermel. He's a marine biologist, and he is out living for six months a year on fishing boats because every fisher, commercial fishing boat needs to have a marine biologist that helps record how many fish they have and make sure they're not killing endangered species and all that stuff. So he's like the one like American dude 
out on this fisher boat full of people that are all different ethnicities, or the Hungarian or Asian, and he, they don't speak any of his language, and he doesn't speak theirs. And he's there every day for six months catalog, categorizing and cataloging their fish and their catch. And I, he comes back. I said, Jamal, how was it? He was like, really hard. <laughs> it is really hard work. It is back-breaking labor. It takes tremendous patience. It's cold, it's wet, it smells, it's lonely. And I thought, what was fishing like in Jesus' time? It can't have been easy, right? They had to be patient. They had to have strength and endurance. They had to be men that were willing to wait for long periods of time with no reward. They had to be just tough, with, able to withstand a lot. I mean, fishing is hard work. And you know, all of those things that made them really good fishermen made them really good disciples. I mean, we could argue all day whether they were actually good disciples or not because most of them were like, you know, numbskulls. But that made them good because you know what you have to do to be a disciple? You have to be patient. You have to have endurance. You have to follow Jesus from town to town with no reward when people are like throwing things at you when you leave. He took the fishermen because he knew that the gifts that they already had would help build his kingdom as fishers of men. So what God has placed in you, he actually wants to use those things in his kingdom. Coming into God's purpose doesn't mean giving up everything you're good at. I didn't know that. You know what I'm really good at? Talking. (laughs) All day I can talk to you. I didn't know that coming into God's purpose would not only give me an avenue in which I could talk to people and make friends, because it's my only thing I love to do in the whole world, but it meant that I would be doing it for his kingdom. I come alive when I get to talk to new people and meet new people, and, and that's my favorite thing on earth. I love this more than anything else on earth, except for, you know, my family and children. That's just understood, right? Okay. <laughs> I didn't know that. I didn't know that coming into God's purposes for my life would make me who I was really made to be. Okay, so God wants to use the gifts that he's already given you, but here's the best part about God. He is not limited to what's already in you, and neither is your purpose. He is not limited by those gifts. He will use them, and he wants to use them, but he doesn't need to be constrained or confined by what you're already good at. In the Bible, Abraham was called to lead his entire, oops, I'd always do this. Moses was called to lead his entire nation out of Egypt. And God said, I want you to go talk to the Pharaoh. And he said back, God, I stutter. I think you've picked the wrong person. If you want a mouthpiece to go to the Pharaoh and to lead your people to freedom, you don't want me, God. I'm not any good at this. And God said, I don't care. I am good at it. He's not limited. So last month, many of you I'm sure know um, that JJ and I went to Kenya. It was amazing. And I will tell you right up front, I was really bad at it. I was. I was was terrified. I don't like to travel. I have to drug myself up to the hilt because my ears hurt me so bad when I travel. I don't like to travel. I don't like to be uncomfortable. I don't like to be dirty. I don't like to not know what each day is going to bring. I want a schedule, and I want it to, like, match my day every day. I want a schedule. It is funny. None of that happens in Kenya. And what's really funny is that JJ, my sister, she had already done all this. She's been in YWAM. She's been on mission trips all the way around the world. And here I am, her mature and older sister. And I was awful at it. As a matter of fact, sometimes we would, I would be like, so, I was so anxious, and I was so nervous, and I was so, like, homesick, and, like, for the first five days, all I wanted to do was go home. I mean, I was really bad at it. I'm not putting myself down here. I was really not good at this. And JJ would be, like, all tucked into her mosquito net in her bed, watching me with my franticness at night in our hotel room. And I'm, like, and I'm like putting our suitcases up to the door in case someone was going to try to break in at night. And I'm, I mean, I'm, like, going psycho. I'm trying to make sure every bug in the room is killed. And she's just laughing her head off at me the whole time. And several times she actually said, I can't believe how bad you are at this. <laughs> and she's like, she's, like, seriously, I'm so much better at this than you are. She actually said that. I'm like, thank you, JJ. You're absolutely right. I mean, I was just not good at it. I really wasn't. It took me six days before I didn't want to go home anymore. I spent the first five days just saying, God, would they let me just take a taxi to the airport and just go home right now? I was bad at it. But you know what? He used me anyway. I can't get over that. 
I'm not even good at this. But because I put myself in the path of his purposes, he used me anyway. Like people were crying when I left. And I was like, five days ago, I didn't even like you. <laughs> I wish that was a joke, it's not. He's not limited. He will use the gifts you have and you will find yourself coming alive in his purpose, but he's not limited by your gifts. So if you're here today, this is the other piece that I knew God said, make sure they get this. Okay, the first piece that God wanted to make sure you got was it's not too late. The second piece that God's saying is if you're telling me God, but I can't because I don't have what it takes. God wants you to know you do. You have what it takes because you have his spirit. And he will use even what you're awful at. He will use what you, th you think, I'm, I'm not educated, or uh, I'm not in a good marriage, or I don't have enough money, or I'm not good at that. And God says, it doesn't matter. When you come into my purpose, I am not limited by what you gifts you already have. I'm not limited by your circumstances. I will use you, and I will put you in places, even things you're not good at, and I will be great in them. Matter of fact, the Bible tells us that his strength is made perfect in our weakness. Okay, he is not limited. He will use the gifts, but he is not limited by your weakness. 2 Corinthians 12, 9 says, My grace is sufficient for you. My power is made perfect in weakness. Okay, the last three are pretty easy. Ready? The U for rewards grow under. The U stands for unique. The gifts that you have in God are unique to you, and your purpose will be unique. This is crucial because we like to play the comparison game life, not just in the church, but in all of life. We compare ourselves with other people all the time. I think women are especially bad at this. I don't know. I've never been a man. You can tell me later. But women are horrible at comparing themselves to other people. They're horrible at it. Everybody else is either better looking or has a better husband or has better children or has better clothes or is skinnier or is fitter or something. I mean, we are almost as a, as a gender in this nation are almost obsessed with it with comparison. And I will tell you unequivocally, comparison is not part of God's purpose for you. Your purpose in God is unique. It is for you. It will not look like my purpose. It won't look like Darlene's purpose. It won't look like Keith's purpose. It won't look like my dad's purpose. It doesn't mean you might not be doing some of the same things, but God's purpose for your life is unique to you. That should give you great joy, but it also should scare you a little because it means he has something for you to do and not anybody else. He actually has something for you to do in his kingdom. Matter of fact, every day he has something for you to do. I know a lady who gets up, I'm not this lady. I, I'm very far from this still. This is like my goal in life. She gets up every morning, she says, okay, God, what's my assignment? And sometimes it's like, you know, do the laundry. And sometimes her assignment is, I want you to talk to that guy at the store, you know, that just checked out your groceries and I want you to invite him to church on Sunday or something. But she believes that every day of her life, God has an assignment for her. And then she figures out what it is and does it. That would be cool, wouldn't it? I'm not quite there yet. Most days, I'm just happy to get through the day in one piece. But God's purpose for you won't look like anybody else's. So to look around the church or to look around the world and try to shape your purpose based on somebody else's, this is never going to work. Your purpose is unique to you. And so you have to actually seek God for your purpose. Okay, ready? Here we go. Oh, I didn't put that word, the words up on time, did I? I'm so sorry for that. Okay, holiness. The H stands for holiness. He will work his holiness in you. You don't have to worry about making yourself righteous. Yes. You don't have to worry about making yourself holy. In his purpose, he will continually work his holiness in you. I used to think that when I got like older in God, I wouldn't have any more struggles with my flesh. I figured when I was young that by the time I got to be old and ancient, which in my head then was like 30, that I would have it all figured out in God. That's rubbish. Poppycock, fiddlesticks. The older I get, Sorry. totally okay. Oops, I did it again. Okay. The older I get in God, the more I realize that he is never done working in me. When I got married, I learned how selfish I was, and God worked on that. When I had children, I learned that I had control issues, and God worked on that. And now I'm getting older, and I realize I might be the most vain human being on the planet. Every year, every day, God is actively working to build his holiness in me. 
And that's always going to be his purpose. He always wants to make you more like him. He always wants to make you more holy, which is a good thing because it means we don't have to attain it on our own. Let him stir up in you something he wants to work on in you. He'll bring it out. And when he brings it out, it's not painful. It's not like a big deal thing. It's not, oh, 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 woe is me. I've been so vain. God's like, Corey, you really need to stop caring about your gray hair so much. And I'm like, okay, God. (laughs) When he's working his holiness in me, it's a part of a beautiful process in his purpose. It's a good thing. He will work his holiness in you. If you've been a Christian for a while, and it's been a while since God stirred something up in you, you might want to go home and pray about this. Because I guarantee he's been trying to work on something in you for a while. You might have turned your ear to it. But he will never stop working his holiness in you. Okay, last one. When you decide to come into God's purposes, you're going to have to fight for it. You're going to have to fight for it. Every day you're going to have to fight for it. If you make a decision, God, I'm all in. You've got all my chips. You've got everything who I am. You've got all my gifts. I'll even give you my weaknesses. When you decide you are all in for God's purposes, you will have to fight for it. This is not going to be an easy thing to just ascribe to. You're going to have to fight for it. And the only thing I can tell you is that the enemy is not so stupid that he will try to turn you 180 degrees the other way. If God's purpose for you is this straight line, like God's purpose is me heading to the kitchen, which I think is really good because there's bagels in there. So God's purpose is for me to head to the kitchen, and the enemy is not so stupid. He's not going to jump right in my path and be like, don't go in there. He's instead going to be like, did you see that thing just right over there? I mean, it takes one degree, right? If you've ever gotten lost in the woods, you only need to go one degree off your compass, right, Dad? I pointed to my father on purpose. You ever get lost in the woods, Dad? Yeah. Yeah, okay. It only takes like a one degree, one degree turn, and you've been taken away from your purpose. And I'll confess to you that I'm all in, man. God's got everything for me. I am 100% sold out for God. And you know what the enemy uses to move me one degree offside? Just busyness. I'm just so busy I can't fulfill his purposes for my life because I got so much stuff going on. He's not like, you should deny God and turn the other way. Because the enemy knows that's not going to work for me. So he's like, oh, did you pick up this good thing over here? Pick this thing up. And then I'm too busy to do what God asked me to do. If you want to fulfill God's purposes for your life, you're going to have to fight for it. Every day, you're going to say, today I've put my foot down and I'm going to fulfill my purposes for the Lord. And you're going to have to not let yourself get distracted. You're going to have to say, God, I'm going to follow you and I'm going to fulfill my purpose for you. And I will fight for it. And the enemy's goal is to take what God wants for you and just turn it just slightly off, just the littlest bit off to the side so that we miss God's real purpose for our life. And he can take things you're good at. Like for me, maybe I like making friends and I like talking. So it would be natural that I would spend like every minute of my life on Facebook because I like people. And that could be a distraction for me. But it's still a good thing. I'm like, I'm still talking. I'm still talking about God. It's good, right? But if I'm filling my whole life with that, then I don't have time to fill his purpose. And there's all sorts of things. You could be a woman that's absolutely gifted with a heart of love. Like maybe you just are so patient and you're so loyal and you're so loving. And God wants to use that to help bring people into his kingdom. And the enemy instead will give you like a really bad boyfriend that's going to suck all of your energy and time and make you not be able to pay attention to the kingdom of God. Or maybe you're a man that by nature you're a caretaker and you're a provider and you like to work with your hands and instead of actually being faithful to do that in God, you're going to instead find, I don't know, a hopeless relationship to pour all that stuff into and not be able to care for who God really wants you to care for. Sometimes we have callings in God that are like amazing. Like maybe God's calling you to be a warrior. You know, he wants you to like go to other nations and and save children that are, you know, being sold in sex sex trafficking or something. And, And some part of you comes alive when you're a warrior, but instead you end up playing video games or you end up, um, I don't know, uh, joining Taekwondo or something. And some part of you still feels fulfilled because there's a little bit of God's purpose in that for you. So you don't go to bed at night thinking, I have no purpose. You go to bed at night thinking, I had a cool day. And that's good for the enemy. That's where the enemy wants you. He wants you to be just slightly off purpose, where you still feel a little bit fulfilled, but you're not actually achieving what God wants for your life. So if you want to follow God's purpose, you're going to have to fight for it. Okay, so furry wars go under her feet. Right? Say that for me. Furry warts go under her feet. All right. Say it like you actually remembered it. Okay. So the F stands for for. God is for you, not against you. 
The G stands for, for what well, W stands for want. Everything you want is found in him. The G stands for gifts. He will use the gifts he's given you, but he's not limited to them. The U stands for unique. Your purpose will be unique. Comparison is never part of God's purpose for your life. The H stands for holiness. He will work his holiness in you as you grow through his purposes in you. And F, if you want his purpose for your life, you're going to have to fight for it. You got it? Okay, that's it. So, Heavenly Father, thank you. Thank you, first and foremost, Lord, for that reminder that it is not too late. That if we don't know what our purpose is in you, and no matter what our life has looked like up until this moment, it is not too late. You can drop our purpose in our lap at any moment. And it's important to know not only who you are, but what you have for us to do. And so, Father, I just pray for each person here. I pray for that renewed sense of purpose. I pray for you to drop that thing in their lap. I pray, Holy Spirit, that they would just get it. They would get what you have for them to do. And I pray for that strength to fight for it every day to say, I will not be distracted. I will not be turned aside, but I will continue to fight for what God has for me in this world, for what God wants me to do. Amen. And I pray, Lord, for that understanding that what, are, what we are weak in does not matter to you. That just as you called Moses who stuttered to lead the Egyptians, the, the, the Israelites out of Egypt, Father, just like you called me to Kenya, even though I was awful at it, you are not limited by our weaknesses. So I thank you for that. And if you're here today and you just know that, that you either don't know what your purpose is in God or you've just, you know that you've allowed maybe something you're not good at to hinder you, I just pray that you just take a moment and just say, God, I am all in. I am all in for you because I believe that you are for me, not against me, and that everything I want is found in you. Just echo that in your heart. And I know that there are people here that would pray with you today just about God's purpose. And so we just thank you for that, Lord. I just pray that you would seal this in our hearts, Father, that we would remember it and that we would be changed by it. Amen. In Jesus' name, amen.